At this time, um, it's my pleasure to share with you a resource from the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women. In celebration of Women's History Month this year, and to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Reverend Dr. Susan Maldry of the Western Pennsylvania United Methodist Conference wrote an article for the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women. She highlighted in that article some of the Methodist women who advocated for suffrage, both in the U United States and also within our denomination. We're happy to share with you today our adaptation of her article in the following video commemoration. There is a well-known song from Mary Poppins that rings out like a battle cry. Cast off the shackles of yesterday, shoulder to shoulder into the fray. Our daughters' daughters will adore us, and they'll sing in grateful chorus. Well done, well done, well done, Sister Suffragette. Although the song was written with England in mind, it seems fitting to recall as the United States marks the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The amendment ratified by Tennessee on August 18, 1920, was the culmination of a century-long struggle to secure women's right to vote. United Methodists might wonder what role the church played in that fight. Many know that Methodists have a long history of strong, leading women. Susanna Wesley, John and Charles's mother, is often called the mother of Methodism for her role in teaching and spiritually forming her children. In fact, American Methodists played a crucial role in the advancement of women in the 19th century. While there is much history of Methodist involvement with the women's suffrage movement left to uncover, Methodists did play a significant role in securing women the right to vote. Knowing some of this history is critical to a full understanding of Methodist DNA. Although most were not early participants in the struggle for women's suffrage, Methodists did lay groundwork throughout the 19th century that contributed to the advancement of women, broadly speaking. Higher education, for example, became a significant focus for Methodists in the 19th century. Part of this emphasis included the promotion of women's higher education, which was viewed as part of Methodism's evangelistic and social responsibility. Co-educational institutions also began to form, particularly in the Midwest, and these places encouraged the development of a new social group in American society. Perhaps one of the most significant developments for Methodist involvement with women's suffrage was the formation of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU, in 1874. The WCTU was not an official Methodist organization, but there is a clear relationship stemming from the early leaders. In 1879, Frances Willard became the second president. She was a Methodist. The WCTU quickly became the largest women's organization in the country, with a mission to reform both church and society. Although temperance was a primary goal, suffrage soon became a method of addressing the issue. The 1876 General Conference of the MEC supported temperance and encouraged the creation of temperance societies in all congregations and Sunday schools. Likewise, many Methodist women supported the WCTU and participated in its endeavors. Quickly, temperance and suffrage went hand in hand. From this point on, leading Methodist women and men were directly involved in the battle to secure the vote. While not all Methodists supported women's suffrage, Methodists had created a space for women's participation and voice in the public sphere. Through her work in temperance, Willard determined she needed to enter into the issue of enfranchisement for women. By her account, God spoke to her while she was on her knees in prayer, saying, you are to speak for women's ballot as a weapon of protection to her home and tempted loved ones from the tyranny of drink. After that encounter, Willard began speaking regularly about suffrage. Willard's voice was critical in the fight for women's suffrage, but her mother church was not always as welcoming as she envisioned. In 1888, the Rock River Conference in Illinois elected Willard as a lay delegate to General Conference. Four other women were also elected by their respective conferences. However, all were denied a seat. 
women's representation was an issue that received increasing denominational attention. Yet, women were not seated at General Conference until 1904 in the MEC. Willard held out hope for her denomination, believing that a church that educated women and worked for their advancement would in time realize equality of women was necessitated, even in terms of ordination. Many other Methodists were active in the push for women's suffrage. While the full history cannot be traced here, a few individuals should be mentioned to show the depth and spread of the work. Isabella Baumfrey, who was born a slave, was converted in 1843, giving herself the name Sojourner Truth. Truth became a Methodist briefly upon her conversion and would speak at camp meetings, preach, and evangelize. She was an early advocate of equal rights for all women. And although she did not remain a Methodist long, demonstrates the way Methodism was laying the groundwork for women who felt called into leadership and engagement of social issues. Suffice it to say, the work to secure women's suffrage was long and hard fought. What is more, Methodists, although certainly not in a unified way, played an active role in the cause. And the case can be made that Methodism itself provided room for the advancement of women, which aided the cause of women's suffrage. Even so, the story was not as complete as some thought, like a reporter who suggested the ratification of the 19th Amendment will probably prove to have been the last battle of a long campaign. Obstacles still persisted in allowing all people to vote. African-American women, Hispanic women, Asian-American women, and indigenous women all serve as examples of the inequality that remained as they faced significant challenges and discrimination in securing rights to the ballot box. The work of the church and societal reform was far from complete, but Methodists continued to engage these issues in the coming years. Mary McLeod Bethune is a prime example of bridging women's rights and civil rights. She worked on both fronts, registering voters after the 1920 ratification of the 19th Amendment and playing a major role in developing civil rights work. There is so much more historical work to be done on the women's rights movement and its connection to American Methodism. Methodists worked for societal and personal transformation. This is in the DNA of the Methodist movement. So we can proclaim, well done, on this 100-year anniversary of the 19th Amendment, while still yearning and working for true equality and justice. Many thanks to Jen Meadows, Cosro's Director of Communication for all of her great work on the production of that video. Well, how fun it is for me this morning to get to introduce Reverend uh, Pamela Pirtle as the facilitator of our next session. Reverend Pirtle has spent most of her professional career in equal employment opportunity, affirmative action, and diversity and inclusion in higher education and government. And then her second career unfolded, and aren't we so glad. Reverend Pirtle received her Master's in Divinity from Garrett Evangelical Theological School and is currently enrolled there as a DMIN student. Prior to accepting the position of Director of Leadership and Accountability at the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women, she served as pastor for Gorham United Methodist Church in the Washington Park neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. She is a member of the Northern Illinois Annual Conference and serves on its finance committee and also the Committee on Religion and Race. She has served as a board member for Black Methodists for Church Renewal. And last, but certainly not least, Reverend, Reverend Pirtle is the coordinator of this I Am Her Women's Leadership Summit. Thank you for your leadership and the gift of this amazing work that we have all been able to experience in this event. Pam, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Becky. 
I didn't anticipate you reading all of that, but I appreciate it. Um, I'm so happy to have with me on this morning two remarkable women. They have such an amazing story. Okay, well, I would be remiss if we didn't give space for this kind of conversation today. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you all, Reverend Francine Thyris and uh, Ms. Clara Esther, to the Women's Leadership Summit. Ms. Clara, take your mic off mute, both of you, so we can hear you. Amen. All righty. Um, it is a joy to have both of you with us. And when we planned this event, we wanted to acknowledge the 100-year anniversary of the 19th Amendment. We realized that this event did not initially provide voting rights for all women, but it was the catalyst that began a movement which resulted in the rights for all women to vote. And as we fast forward to the year 2020, a general election year, some of the same challenges that this country has faced over the years with regards to voting seem to be rearing its ugly head. So first, we want to take a little bit of time for each of you to share a little bit about yourselves, and then we'll move into our prepared topics on voter suppression and civil rights activism and how we can get out the vote. So let me start with you, Reverend Thyrus. You've had an expansive career. And so tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning, Reverend uh, Pertle, and good morning to all of those who have joined us uh, this conference this morning. Thank you for asking me to be a part of this. It is indeed an honor to be a part of this gathering. And uh, a little bit about myself. Well, I'm a native born Chicagoan, born in Chicago. Uh, on the south side, and my parents were part of the Great Migration from Alabama, North Fork, Alabama, Tuscaloosa. They were part of that Great Migration. They came and uh, brought uh, everything they could with them from the south. They worked hard. We moved to the south side of Chicago. They brought their church, uh, what was inside of them, and replanted it actually on the south side of Chicago and many other churches, storefront churches and others that grew and grew and grew and they became great buildings and great worship centers. They uh, also included their religious and church work in their everyday life. It was not a, just a Sunday thing. We couldn't do those basic things like do any work on Sunday. We had to prepare for church on Saturday night including ironing our clothes, uh, uh, washing our shoes, ironing our rivers, all of that, because Sunday was a day of worship, and we could not work and do those other things. As a part of the Great Migration, they brought with them that work ethic, and they worked hard. Eventually, uh, them and their family members uh, bought houses and uh, apartment buildings. They I worked two and three jobs. Basically, my mother was a housewife, but she was an entrepreneur. She sold full of products. I don't know how many people on this remember full of products. She sold those, and and uh, her and her friend they made sandwiches and would take them and serve them at lunch at factories. So even though she was uh, basically a housewife, she did many many things. She brought those values. She was hardworking and was willing to do anything. And, and education was a major part of their life. They always told us to get your education, get your education, and they emphasized it. And we were not allowed to miss school. We had to respect the teachers and we had to do our homework. We had uh, church school uh, clothes and home clothes. We had school clothes and, and runabout clothes at home. So we had to come home and take those off. So you, we brought a lot of values with us, but in spite of that, in spite of the fact they got away from some of the blatant racism, we were still encountered in many ways with uh, uh, racism that comes from trying to buy houses and do other things. Yes. As I continued to grow, I uh, went to Inglewood High School, then went to Chicago Teachers College, as it was called at that time. I got my bachelor's from there and then became a teacher. And uh, 
they got married, had children, went back and got my master's in urban education and stayed in uh, education for uh, over 20 years, became part of the Chicago Teachers Union, become a district a supervisor for them. I began to be involved with the political side and the structure. I learned about all of, of the processes and that I needed to, attended their conventions, conference, got people out to vote, was a part of the uh, boycotting for better education for all, but particularly for Blacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, work, we worked for smaller classrooms and um, we worked for and boycotted for more inclusiveism and equal pay benefits and uh, all of those things that, in, in fact, I think we're still working for in many ways, ways today. After that, uh, I really became a little burned out, 20 something years, so I mm -hmm. went to law school. Right. So, took three children and I went to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. I didn't know anybody there, didn't know anything about Omaha and attended Creighton Law School. I got my uh, uh, master's, uh, my JD there. And after finishing that and working there for a few years, I came back to Chicago and I became a part of the uh, a state's attorney's office, becoming an assistant state's attorney, a prosecuting criminal attorney and uh, that was an eye opener for me as I began to see that uh, system, that prison system and judicial system and how blacks and brown people, how we were impacted by it. And mm -hmm. it really touched me as I began to see that just how it did not, in many aspects, did not help us out. In fact, it created a worse uh, situation for us. After realizing and looking at that, I went to uh, Garrett Seminary to become a pastor. That is something, a vision I had all the ways when I was in my middle teens. I could always see myself preaching, but I would put it out of my mind because the church I came from did not allow uh, women to become pastors, did not even allow women to get up on the pulpit. But it was so strong that I went into that, got my... Um, Masters in Divinity and uh, became part of the United Methodist Church, became an elder and started uh, being a pastor, an associate pastor at different churches and uh, uh, began to see that that was a way that we could really influence a people uh, before they got involved with the uh, criminal system when they were young and their families and their children and it, it just gave me many opportunities. And from that, I became involved with the conference. I even became involved with the General Board of Discipleship, spending four years in Nashville, Tennessee, as yeah. director of congregational revitalization. So, uh, um, uh, Reverend Pert, I don't know how much more you want me to That's talk good. about. That's good. That's good. As you, you know, know, I can go on and on and on, but I know we we got we have a schedule. We're gonna share. We're gonna share the platform, right? <laughs> Amen. Yes, Let's share it. Amazing, amazing story, and I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and just how your parents' values impacted your life in the way it did. Yes you to be the person that you are today and I really also like how you wove the civil rights into your entire trajectory everything from your work as an educator and the union and going on to law school and then working uh, in the justice system and then coming into the church all of those things have made one, you one other one other things Reverend Perdo when you said that how my parents influenced me I, I have to say that my daughter is now in the ordination process Yes, to, become a, to become an elder, and she is pastoring a church. Go on, Reverend Turtle. Your daughter Beverly very, very well. Yes, yes. So this is wonderful. Thank you. I want to just shift a little bit to Miss Clara Esther. And Miss Clara, you have an amazing story as well. I mean, your background and your history and the things that you've been a part of, in particular as it pertains to the civil rights movement, is just powerful. So I'd like for you to share a little bit about your background, know where you're from, and you're living now in a different state, but just tell us about where you began and how the civil rights movement and all of those things impacted you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this wonderful event. And good morning to everyone. 
Uh, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, born, raised, baptized, um, and I moved to Mobile, Alabama in 1970. Uh, in 1986, I was commissioned a deaconess of the United Methodist Church, and I just completed my 2016 to 2020 term as National Vice President of the United Methodist Women. Both of, both of my parents were out of the state of Mississippi, and my father was fortunate to get a job with the Illinois Central Railroad, so a lot of Mississippi uh, families moved to Memphis to take on that great opportunity to get benefits and all the things that the railroad provided. I was a member uh, of Centenary United Methodist Church uh, where I claim the, the, the founder, the foot soldier of nonviolence, uh, Reverend Dr. James Lawson, Jr. Uh, was our, my pastor from seventh grade until I moved to Mobile and joined the church there. Um, I graduated from Lemoyne Owen College in Memphis. Um, and because of my involvement in conversations and, and messages and uh, sometimes just uh, events that Reverend Lawson provided for our congregation, I became more and more aware of the discrimination that people that look like me were going through. Um, and so they allowed me that opportunity for, by providing the knowledge of that information. Because uh, I grew up happy. Uh, we didn't run into crisis or anything as a child and even as a teenager. When I was in high school, my American history instructor went further than just the American history books that we inherited. He shared with us other books that told us our history. Excellent. And then I was starting to get probably angry with a system that didn't want to share what we had contributed what we had done, the things that we had accomplished. Uh, and so I, I'm, I claim those two things as part of what set me off in getting more involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, I lived under the Jim Crow law. Um, if you were Black up to a certain point, probably the late 50s, you could not go into a hospital and have a baby. So my brother and I, and even my sister were born at home with a midwife and a doctor, fortunately, coming to the house for that delivery. Uh, I remember uh, so clearly my best friend that was a lot older than me. I was in the seventh grade, she was 18, had learned how to drive. Uh, was driving to Mississippi with her aunt and sister, was in a very fatal car accident. And when we got the word, my mom and I went to the hospital, a uh, city hospital, and I'll never forget seeing my friend's bloody face, hollering and screaming in pain. And I saw people that didn't look like us walking into a section of the hospital to be treated and coming out with a Band-Aid on a finger. And she continued to wait and recover. Uh, my mom, because of the lateness of the hour, decided we would come home. And she stayed across the street. Um, and I remember her coming through the door about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, telling my daddy that Myrtle didn't make it. And my mom and dad both shedding tears in their bedroom. So I can, I live, I witness, I was part of a lot of discrimination that I had never seen before in my lifetime. Uh, as a young child in Chattanooga, I remember my mom being harshly talked to because we were in the white only section. 
And I remember asking her why did they treat her that way? And why when we went across the street to a cafe, my brother couldn't go in that was six years old because he was a threat to white women. Uh, but my mom held up one finger and said, one day, one day. Um, and so I was schooled and trained to be a community organizer while I was still in Memphis, my junior, senior year in high school. And when I moved to Mobile in 1970, I took on that responsibility and I have continued to speak up and speak out around social issues that affect anyone that has been deprived of their human rights. Um, and I will do that until it is fixed. Uh, what's going on around our world today uh, is devastating to me because we have backtrodled over history that I thought we had gained so much. Yeah. That's why you hear people constantly saying enough is enough. Yeah. We're tired of being tired of being tired. Yeah. Uh, but that's what brought me to where I am and who I am. Well, thank you, Ms. Ms. Claire, because what I'm hearing from you in particular as I compare that uh, with uh, Reverend Francine Thyris is that um, what you experienced in the South was much more blatant discrimination than maybe um, Reverend Thyris would argue she experienced in the North. It was a little bit more subtle. So it was done through policies and, and, and procedures in the North, whereas it was just straight in your face in the South. As you mentioned, your mother being talked to very rudely in public spaces um, and you seeing the signs where you couldn't sit in certain sections of a restaurant. Not that those things didn't exist in the North, but I would imagine just for hearing the stories you two are telling, it sounds like it was much more blatant. So I want to take you both to the year 1968. And I want to just share, have you share a little bit about um, what your time was like in that in those years. I know that you both shared with me how you were involved in civil rights events, um, both in the North and in the South. But Reverend Thyrus, tell me a little bit about what the year 1968 was for you. We know that's the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yeah, yeah. What was going on in Chicago in 1968 that you can recall um, in, in your life? Well, uh, the, the Civil Rights uh, Act was, was uh, supposed to expand on uh, uh, some previous um, uh, legislations and acts and its parents concerning discrimination and all that kind of stuff. But our everyday life, even though that passed, it, it became uh, uh, supposed to have been law, uh, things were still going on pretty much uh, as they had been. I've often heard that uh, if you want to change it, something, uh, uh, getting it, uh, making a law is fine, but it has to also enter the hearts of the people who are actually living it every day. But in 1968, as I said before, I had graduated from college and was involved with the Chicago Teachers the Union and with the family. And uh, right before that, uh, we had been so impacted by the death of Emmett Till. Emmett Till uh, family lived in Chicago. They still do from, from Chicago. And uh, uh, when that happened, it just brought a uh, fear to a, a lot of us and all of us at uh, the cruelty of, uh, uh, well, the whites, uh, people that did it, actually. And so um, we began to identify even more that same type of hatred towards Blacks in terms of the school situation, jobs, uh, where we could live. There were still certain areas we couldn't live in and we had to carefully move. And sometimes we would be the first to move in a neighborhood. And like I said, we suffered many types of discrimination. And um, it, it was a time that the Black Panthers came about and we were embracing them because they were embracing us. They were doing wonderful things in the Black neighborhood. And then we began to see tension rise in, even more as we tried to peacefully uh, tell them that, hey, we are equal. We are the same as you are. We are under the Constitution also. We are supposed to be 
treated as brothers and, and sisters. So we began to boycott. We non-violently boycott. We took on Martin Luther King's uh, uh, rhetoric of how to say this is wrong and this is right and to show that we would not take it anymore. So we began to uh, listen to that and to walk and talk with him. We organized in the Chicago Teachers Union. We would walk and we had signs. In fact, um, one day uh, a picture was taken and my picture was on the front page of the Sun-Times uh, uh, peacefully protesting, saying we need uh, fewer students in our classroom. We need more supplies. We need better working conditions. We need better pay. We need to be able to move where we want to move. We need to be able to uh, uh, at least compete with the jobs, interview with jobs. Even though we were uh, mostly in this sector, had finished school and had our degrees in education, we could still feel that ceiling over us that there, no matter what we did, we could not break through because of the color of our skin. And before they were saying, well, you don't have this, you don't have this, and you don't have that. We did everything they told us we should do in order to be successful and succeed. And we still could not break through. We still were denied opportunity. We still were not hired. We still could not uh, go places that we wanted to go. So we, em we really embraced uh, the Black Panthers and Martin Luther King tactics because in the end, they were all trying to do the same thing. And we were willing to do that also. I know Jesse Jackson, the church that I was passing over, St. James at that time, we did community organization. We even uh, had uh, Obama was a community organizer. And he was a part of that as I was pastoring on the south side of Chicago. We went through training of how to, to be community organizers to get others to do the same and to have a leadership and a direction and a goal and to uh, not just sit by and let things happen. You know, it's okay to sing soon and very soon, but we have to live today. God was telling us that there are things we can do right now. There are ways that we can protest and, and tell the people that, no, this is not what God wanted. This is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are not going to stand by and let you dictate and tell us that it is. So we did get together. We did organize. We did, we did protest. We did lift up the banner of the Holy Spirit. We did uh, get faith and even more faith. And we did say, walked around or walked around seven days until the walls of Jericho began to fall down. We did not let anybody just slap us upside the face and stop us. We were that generation that we were going to do something about it. And I began to see that same generation rise today. And yes. we're going to have to embrace that generation and encourage them to say, come on, you can do it too. I'm sorry, Reverend Prairie, you don't start at me. Well, you know, you got that preaching instinct and you tell you got to go right straight in. So we understand that. Why? My goodness, my goodness. One of the things that I want to ask you about as you were talking, I was just trying to figure out how did the death of Martin Luther King impact you? Oh, my goodness. Um, I was in school um, at 68. No, 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 68. I was teaching, but I remember that so clearly. Uh, my, my oldest child had been born, I think, the year before. Yeah, the year before that. And it impacted us so much that my husband actually went to the funeral, actually went there and to be a part of it. I didn't go because I had just had a child. And it just knocked the wind out of our sails temporarily because mm -hmm. we just believed how could they be against a, a nonviolent person preaching the Bible, expounding on the, on the uh, disciplines and the word of God and Jesus. And it's just because they claim to be Christians too. And it knocked us out. It knocked us out. But we had to pull together 
and began to say, even though his body, physical, might be dead, his spirit is still alive, and we are going to have to carry on that message. It was only one of him, but there are thousands and thousands and millions of us, so we can do a thousand times what he could try to do as one individual. So it encouraged us. It pushed us forward. We began to get more involved. Amen. Amen. I, I feel like I'm in church almost. Well, well Miss Claire, I want to ask you the same question. Take me back to 1968. And this is really important for our audience to know because you happen to be there on that dreadful day. So tell us about 1968 and what was going on in your life? I was a junior in college then. And once again, my pastor, Jim Lawson, was uh, so involved in that, that strike and would preach about it. And he encouraged us to get engaged. Um, so the 1968 sanitation strike, and a lot of people are not aware of why it started, um, but Cole and Walker, two black men that actually would pick the garbage cans up and dump the trash and garbage into the uh, big truck and then place it back on your curb. Uh, and then they would ride on the back of the trucks. Um, it was a bad electrical thunder lightning storm. And they asked the white driver, could they sit in the cab with him? And he pretty much told them, you know your place. And so they, to get out of the heavy rain, they got inside the back of the truck and lightning hit the truck and it started spinning and both of their bodies were caught in that. And the next day, 1300 sanitation workers walked off their jobs until their issues were later resolved. Um, so every day we would um, have opportunities to go downtown and picket uh, white businesses. And we would have mass meetings at night. And I remember this one evening and I'm cramming for an exam the next day and I'm really kind of not focused into what's happening. And I'm sitting there and I'm open a, a bag lunch that had two oatmeal cookies and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And these uh, two children with their mom had asked if they could sit next to me and I let them in and they saved a seat. And I, I just didn't, it didn't jog with me at that time, why? Um, but as I was getting ready to open my cookies rather than the sandwich, I saw the children staring and I pulled out the sandwich and asked the mom, could they have it? Thinking she would break it in half. And, and she actually broke it in fourths. She gave each child a quarter of the sandwich. She ate a quarter and she wrapped the last quarter and put it in the bag. And then I offered them the cookies that she divided again, but in halves and each child got a half and she saved a half. Uh, the slogan for the sanitation strike was, I am a man. And every night, pretty much, we would have mass meetings. They would allow sanitation workers to share their stories. And this man had gotten up and talked about the struggle he had gone through, not knowing how long he was going to be able to stay in this rented facility uh, of a home because he was behind with every payment because they were no longer receiving salary. Um, and I'll never forget him at the very end standing up saying, I am a man. And he said it repeatedly. And you could feel the tears flowing down his face. Well, after he came off the stage, he walked down the aisle and I was gonna touch him because I was so uh, inspired by his words. And he asked me, could he get in to sit next to his family? I had shared a meal with that man's family. Mm -hmm. And she then gave him that half a cookie and that one quarter of that sandwich. Mm -hmm. um, I realized how they sacrificed so much 
Uh, they were making nothing in salaries. They had no benefits. They were struggling every day, but they were willing because they are men and men of God to stand up and say, wrong is wrong and the system needs to correct this. Um, no. So I am um, overwhelmed, I think, during that time with all the stories I heard, all the people I met, and all the situations I ended up in. That's an amazing story, uh, Ms. Clara. Um, but I want to take you back to April the 4th, 1968. Tell us about that. Well, I had left school, uh, gone to Claiborne Temple, uh, do a little studying, and one of the SCLC staff members, James Orange from Philadelphia, Mississippi, said that Dr. King had had wonderful catfish earlier that day, and he was going to treat all of us to a catfish dinner at the hotel. And so about three cars of us drove over to the Lorraine, and as I got out of my car, um, I noticed at some point walking toward the lobby area uh, of, the, of the building that the lobby was in that Dr. King had come out of his room. And I froze and I stood there just looking up at him. And uh, he's chatting and laughing and, and, and very pleasant, loving conversation with people down below in the parking area. And what seemed to sound like a truck backfiring, uh, but I had never taken my eyes off of him. And I watched him being lifted up and thrown back on that balcony level. And um, Roberta, I don't know what or why, but all I know is I was standing over him at that point, because I took off and went up those steps and buckled his belt. Uh, when I checked his pulse, it was very, uh, it was very little beat at all. Uh, mm -hmm. his, his eyes were open because he had been in such a pleasant conversation. He had a beautiful smile on his face and he was looking up because he's laying flat down to heaven to me. Um, and all I could recall was the night before at, at Mason Temple would several thousand people hearing him say, uh, I've been to the promised land and I've looked over and I've seen, you know, uh, I may not get there with you, but mm -hmm. we as a people will get to the promised land. My God, my God. Whew, I can't even imagine um, what that day was like for you and you were so young. It almost brings tears to my eyes as I listen to both of you speaking and especially with regards to that fateful day. Um, let's just move a little bit forward to where we are now. Um, when we look and see how the vote is being suppressed all over the country, I want to know what do you both see now that you've seen before and how would you advise us to work to get the vote out today? Francine? Uh, well, um just like uh, the death of uh, Martin Luther King kind of knocked us, the wind out of us because we were trying so hard, I can see that similar reaction uh, to the murder of George, George uh, Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. It just intimidates us so much and it brings us a, a, a temporary fear in, uh, in our minds and our communities and we want to be protected and protect our family uh, to the point that um, we kind of stopped for a moment. But I then I think, like I said, just as we did before, we have got to continue on to uh, fight this battle. If not, it will overtake us. So we have got to tell the stories that you are presenting today. We have to tell it to the young folks over and over in our churches, in our community, to uh, encourage them, and we have to uh, get out the vote to get those young people to keep on doing what they are doing. But in addition to that, the most powerful tool we have right now is the vote. And so we've got to uh, 
do everything we can to get that vote out, to encourage them, to uh, knock on doors, to talk to people, to not take it for granted, to not let them be discouraged that uh, uh, it's just so overwhelming. I'm tired. I'm tired. Enough is enough. Uh, when is this going to end? I've got to give up. No, we can never give up. We've got to be that catalyst for hope and encouragement so that uh, uh, people will get out and, and vote, uh, Reverend Berta. Amen. Yes, I, I totally agree. What about you, uh, Ms. Clara? Well, one of the things that I remember uh, in, in some of our songs we used to sing was freedom isn't free. Freedom isn't free. You have to pay the price. You have to sacrifice for your liberty. And the young people today that are all gathered and protesting are going through that freedom isn't free song. Uh, and I encourage them, uh, if they're listening or if their parents are listening, to share with them the urgency of voting and taking that vote into that booth or whether you do it on an absentee or whether you do it by early voting, it's important that we vote, vote, and vote. Uh, we need to look at every candidate for every position. Uh, we need to look at things we can do in our own local churches. Uh, we have seniors in our churches that we need to be checking on to make sure that they have received an absentee ballot, getting them one, or if they just absolutely got to go vote, we need to understand what opportunities may be there, like skipping in line because they're on a walker or in a wheelchair. We need to do things to uh, try to get people registered where register early voters absentee has not shut down. And you can do that by simply uh, standing in front of a grocery store with a sign saying, are you registered? Register here. Uh, they closed a lot of bars down, but that's another place you can go and stand out and say, have you registered? You can register here. Offering stamps so that those uh, absentee ballots can be mailed in. Also, I think we need to be uh, conscientious of the fact that voting places are changing. And when we hear of a voting site that has changed, we need to notify as many people in that area by putting signs out saying your voting site has been changed from this building to a building four blocks away or a mile away. Um, I, I pray to God that every protester, every concerned citizen in our country will take that vote to the polls, whether it's done by absentee, by mail, whether it's done by early voting, or whether it's standing in that long line um, on that Tuesday. Um, we need to also finally come together as sororities and fraternities and the NAACP and the uh, League of Women Voters, every organization, churches need to come together to push the right to vote. And in my case, always remembering that people died in the Montgomery uh, Legacy Museum, there are young people tied to a rope hanging from a tree. Mm and a young five-year-old white boy asked his mom what did he do and his mom looked down at him and said he voted people mm. have fought and died for vote to vote and for us to take it as a joke to erase it to pass it by because no candidate impresses us mm. that is a wasted vote and so we need to speak up and speak out that is so right. That is so right. And I thank you, um, 
Ms. Clara for sharing some of those ideas on ways in which people can get involved at the local level, even in your local congregation, in your community, in your neighborhood, the things that people can do to assist others in helping them get out the vote, which is very, very important. No vote, no voice, you know, I mean, and so we want to make sure everyone does register to vote and gets their, their ballot to the polls or stands in the long lines and supports all of those who have needs. So both of you have been telling us that one, we need to unify, we need to come together and be like-minded and knowing, as you said, it doesn't matter if the candidates don't impress you, you're voting between one thing or another. And if you don't vote, that's a decision that you've made as well. And so we want to encourage that, we want to encourage people to come together and if any one of you who's listening today has any problems voting, please contact the National Election Protection Hotline number and their website, which should be scrolling across the screen shortly. But their phone number is 866-R-VOTE. If you have any problems, contact the National Election Protection Hotline and you will be routed when you call them to your local state and um, website, which has state specific information about the voting laws in your area, voting locations and requirements. And so it's important that you contact them. 1-866-R-VOTE, or uh, you can go to 866-R-VOTE.org. So thank you both ladies for being with us on today. This has been a rich conversation and your experiences have really, really, you know, illuminated the need for all of us to be civically minded and actively engaged on what's happening in the world around us. And I cannot thank you enough. The General Commission on the Status and Role of Women, we are grateful for your gift for us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.